everyone, Jason here. Today I'm excited to show you Crystal's latest model. About a year and a half ago, she built this wonderful kinetic sculpture of a human head that opened up to reveal this colorful world. And it was always her intention that it be the first in a series of similar sculptures that would open up in different ways and show different aspects of the human mind. And last week she finally finished the second model in the series, which is entitled The Engineer. And today I'm going to show you how it works. There is a lot going on in here, but before I walk you through the mechanics, I wanted to point out a few things about what is going on. Everything is powered by this crank that we can insert at the base of the skull, including generating the electricity that powers the light. There are no batteries in this model and no external power sources. But I'll explain all that in a second. Two other things to note about the light are that it doesn't start rising until it is cleared the side of the head and the light itself doesn't come on until the platform is fully emerged. There's also this engine block in the back and piston in the front, which are always operating whenever the crank is being turned in either direction. Okay, so how does it all work? I have this standalone model and all of the components laid out here, and I'm going to explain how each of them work as I add them to this model. First, we're gonna take a look at the platform itself. Underneath, there is a central drive shaft, the end of which can be removed along with the crank just by pulling it out. Coming off this drive shaft, we have two axles, at the end of which each of them has a gear that's exposed to the top of the platform. And this is how most of the components are going to be powered. In addition, the rear axle has these two eight tooth gears, which mesh with these two gear racks underneath the platform. And that is how the crank can be used to push the platform in and pull it out. When the platform gets to the end of the gear racks, those two A-tooth gears just fall off the end of it, which prevents the platform from continuing to come out. And when you reverse the crank, the teeth of those gears catch the gear racks again to pull the platform back in. Next up, we'll take a look at the light post. And this component actually has its own drive system, which translates the rotation of this drive gear one-to-one -to, -one to this gear, which raises and lowers the light post via this gear rack. When we add this to the platform, we will see that the drive gear meshes with this separate gear rack. But because it doesn't actually get there until the platform is partially merged, the light won't start rising until it's cleared the side of the head. Now, what about the light itself? We are actually going to use this old Lego motor to generate electricity for it. Now, normally we provide electricity to these motors in order to get them to rotate the output shaft. But, as we all know, or maybe you'll learn for the first time today, a motor and a generator are essentially the same thing, so we can just manually rotate the output shaft to generate electricity. We're going to drive the motor through this gear on the rear axle of the platform through this drive system here. But you might notice that there's a gear missing in this drive system. And that's because Crystal didn't want the light to actually turn on until the platform had fully emerged. So the missing gear is mounted to the wall at the end here. So as the platform emerges, that gear gets inserted into the gear system, drives the motor, and turns the light on. But of course in the actual model, the light is mounted at the top of the light post, and all of the wiring is hidden throughout the model. Next up we have the engine block, and the pistons of the engine block just sit freely within it and they're pulled down by gravity and there's a drive shaft with cams along it that push the pistons up and down as it rotates. And the engine block is powered through this gear on the axle coming up from underneath the platform. So if we just insert it there. And lastly we have the large piston which is pretty straightforward. 
and which gets driven off the gear train driving the engine block. And we just insert it there. Now everything is together and that is pretty much all there is to it. Easy as one, two, three.
Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you this custom ball clock which I designed and built entirely out of Lego. The way it works is that every minute a ball is picked up from the reservoir in the back, which we'll see shortly, and deposited at the top of this rail system. For balls I'm using these Bionicle Zamor spheres, and the rail system is built using a set of parallel flat tiles that creates a channel that the balls can roll through. Each ball on the bottom rail represents one hour, each ball on the middle rail represents 10 minutes, and each ball on the top rail represents one minute. So the current time is 5.39. I also have these alternate rails uh, with uh, number tiles on them so you can more easily tell time, but I prefer the look without them. When a rail gets full, it is it tips, which we'll see in a minute. And for the upper two rails, when that happens, the last ball drops down to the next rail while the rest of them go back to the reservoir. So now it is 5.40. So let's see what's going on in the back here. The balls in the reservoir are funneled down into this channel where they wait to be picked up by the pickup, which is attached to this Technic chain. The actual pickup is one of these small little tread links, which might be difficult to see. And all it has are two little minifig hammers stuck on either side of it. The end of the channel actually has these two little teeth pieces here, which hold the last ball. And then as the pickup comes around, the hammers pass on either side of the teeth and pick the ball up. In addition to driving the pickup chain, the motor also drives this piston, which agitates the balls in the reservoir to prevent them from jamming. At the top of the chain, the ball is directed into this channel, again using a couple of these teeth pieces, and into the rail system. I've now set it up to be 11.59, so we can see what happens when all the rails empty at once. And now it's 12 o'clock. Hey, what is up everybody? Today we're going to take a look at a long overdue update to my Ski Chalet project on LEGO Ideas. Ever since I posted it almost a year ago, I have wanted to explore trying to get the minifigs back on the ski lift so they could keep skiing indefinitely. And after a couple of months of prototyping and tweaking the design, I finally got something that works pretty reliably. If you want to help give this project a shot at becoming an official LEGO set, you can head on over to LEGO Ideas and add your support. So how does this all work? The lift itself is basically the same as in the original model with these clip-on bars to push the minifigs up and it's got a tensioning system on the bottom wheel to accommodate the variability in the cable thickness. And you can watch the original video for more details about that if you are interested. In the original model, the lift pushed the minifigs directly onto the slope, but I found it just wasn't quite reliable enough. Sometimes the minifigs would get stuck. So now the lift pushes them onto this turntable, which brings them around to the top of the ski slope and sends them down the hill. When they reach the bottom, they ski onto this lower turntable, which brings them around to the base of the lift, where they wait for the next bar to come and push them up to the top again. 
One thing I discovered during prototyping is that the performance of the skiers actually varied depending on environmental conditions. For example, the temperature and humidity in this room, and also how long the model had been sitting around, probably accumulating dust. So sometimes they were really slow and they wouldn't actually make it to the bottom of the hill. So I also added some height control to the hill using this knob on the side so I can adjust the angle of the slope. So if the skiers are having a slow day, I can raise the angle to speed them up. Or if they're having a fast day, I can lower it back down. So let's take a look underneath. The model is being driven by a single M motor and I have a battery box at the back here. But we'll just remove that for now. Since the space is pretty limited underneath the bottom of the slope, I'm using these plate gears to transfer the rotation to the bottom turntable, which is just mounted on the last one. And I have a pretty standard Technic drivetrain to transfer the rotation to the top of the ski hill. For the height adjustment, the control knob is connected to these four orange Technic lift arms, which act as cams that the entire top of the ski hill rests on. So when you rotate the control knob one way, those cams will push the top of the ski hill up. And when you rotate it the other way, it will lower it back down. The lift and the upper turntable are rotated through this upper Technic drivetrain. And the rotation is transferred up through this vertical axis, which drops down below the top of the hill. And that axle can slide freely up and down through this half bevel gear underneath. So that no matter what height the ski hill is at, that gear will always turn that axle. And that is pretty much it for this one. As I mentioned, this project is on LEGO Ideas, so if you want to see it potentially become a set, you can head on over there and add your support. It's really easy to do. I'll add a link in the description, and I obviously would really appreciate it. As always, thanks for watching, keep on building, and I'll see you in the next one. Jason here. A couple of years ago I posted this model of Sisyphus pushing his boulder and I was pretty happy with it at the time. But after building the Lawnmower Man model a few months ago I took a look at it again and thought there was definitely some room for improvement. Especially to the body support which is this kind of ugly black rod sticking out of the base. With the Lawnmower Man I ended up using these transparent bars to support the body which are much less visible, and I thought I could do something similar with this model. While I was at it, I thought I might as well see what other improvements I could make, and this is the result. Before I go into all the details about the changes I made, I have created updated building instructions for this model, which, as always, are freely available over at jkbrickworks.com. I have also uploaded this model to mockhub.com for anyone looking to buy all the parts to build their own version of it. At first glance, it might not seem like a lot has changed, and in terms of the overall design and appearance, it's really not much different from the original. The biggest visual difference is, of course, the removal of the black support rod, which cleans up the top of the stand nicely. But I also ended up changing quite a few other smaller details as well. For example, I rounded out the boulder by using these round plates on all of the panels, and I also added some door rail pieces to smooth the transition between adjacent panels. And as a result, the new boulder is a lot less blocky than the old one. When I designed the original, these four by four round planes weren't all that common in dark gray, but in the last couple of years, they have appeared in a lot of sets, making them much more readily available. The Lego group is also constantly designing new parts, and a part that didn't even exist when I designed the original model is this inverted one by two curved slope which allowed me to simplify the construction of some of the details in the base. For example, in the old model, I had to use some tricky techniques to invert regular curved slopes to build the bottom of the clouds. Whereas in the new model, I can use conventional building techniques using the inverted slopes. On the other hand, some parts have become a lot more scarce in the last couple of years. For example, I was using these click hinges for the ankles of the figure but they were only available in a handful of sets and haven't been in production since 2006, 
which means that over time their price in the secondary market has slowly increased as the supply has dwindled. Now the average price for these four parts, for example, on bricklink.com, new, is $24 US. Now when I design a model for myself, I don't really pay much attention to the cost of parts, but when I provide instructions for a model, I do try and take into account the cost and availability of parts when I can. And I don't think anybody needs to pay $24 US for Sisyphus's ankles. So in the new model, I designed the ankle using much more common parts. And although it doesn't quite look the same as the original, these parts cost less than a dollar. <laughs> so I think the trade-off is totally worth it. If we take a look inside the model, the drive mechanism for the legs hasn't changed. But for the boulder and the body, I had to redesign the mechanism to accommodate the new way of supporting the torso. If we compare it to the original, you can see it has changed quite a bit. I removed the chain and crankshaft and now I'm using a set of linkages. The motion isn't exactly the same as in the original model, but it's pretty close. And I think the changes are worth it to remove that black support rod and clean up the top of the bowler. The body still moves forward just before the boulder does, which still gives you that subtle little bend of the elbows as the figure pushes the boulder. Other than that, the only other changes I made were some minor changes to the general construction of the model, just to optimize the part and lot count, uh, to make it a little bit easier for those people that do want to source the parts themselves. And that's about all there is to it. I don't typically revisit older models, but I do find it interesting sometimes to see if I would do anything differently as I learn new building techniques and as LEGO Group releases new parts. As I said, you can find building instructions over at jkbrickworks.com. And if you want to build one of these yourself, you can order a kit with all the parts over at mockhub.com. As always, thanks for watching. Keep on building. And I'll see you next time.
Hey everyone, Jason here. A couple of months ago, I posted a video of my Robot Dreams GBC module in action. And today we're gonna to take a closer look at how it works and discuss some of the design aspects of it. Probably the biggest design feature that wasn't really apparent in that video is that it is completely modular. On the front end, we have the power unit, which right now has an L motor and rechargeable battery box, but pretty much any motor and power source can be used. Obviously in a show environment, I'll be running it off of a nine volt regulator. We also have the intake unit, which is just a variation of a pretty standard GBC intake design. In the middle, there can theoretically be any number of robots and the transfer pedestal units between them. And at the end, we have an exit unit, which feeds the balls to the intake of the next GBC module in the line. Even though the number of robots is theoretically unlimited, practically, of course, there's a limit to how many a motor will be able to drive. As more robots are added, there is obviously more friction in the system and more work that needs to be done to pick up and move the balls. The robots themselves are just mounted on a turntable so they can rotate from side to side and their arms are attached to an axle running through the shoulders so they can move up and down. This design allows for a single control rod mounted on that shoulder axle to be able to both rotate the robots and raise and lower the arms. By connecting this rod to the end of a crank, we can see that rotating the crank does double duty to do both of those. Essentially, the horizontal component of the crank's movement translates to the rotation of the robot, and the vertical component of that movement translates to moving the arms. And we can oscillate that crank back and forth by driving it from this reciprocating arm coming out of the power unit. And as you can see, that arm is segmented so that it can be extended to accommodate however many robots are in the system. A lot of people commented on the relatively new splat gears that I'm using to transfer power to the control crank. And there is a very specific reason I use these gears instead of normal Technic gears. That is because they have this cool property where is if you have two of them meshed together, you can perfectly mirror the movement of two arms attached to those gears. This is actually impossible to do with any pair of modern Technic gears. One of those arms will always be offset by a little from being perfectly mirrored. You can also see that I've doubled them up. Since their teeth aren't primarily designed for mechanical performance, this just really locks them together so the gears don't slip. Now let's take a look at how the robots actually pick up and release the balls. I really wanted to keep it as simple as possible, so I came up with this passive system using these soft rubber Technic connectors mounted on the ends of two axles. These axles are free to rotate, so the grips can open and close and I'm using a rubber band to constantly pull them to the closed position. There is a Technic connector in the middle with a couple of half pins jutting out on either side, which keeps the closed position just a little bit smaller than the diameter of one of these balls. So that when the gripper is placed over a ball, the ball fits nicely inside and the elastic keeps enough tension to hold the ball. To release the ball, I just added a bar to one of the grip axles so that as the entire robot moves to the left, that bar will hit a stanchion on the pedestal unit, which opens the grip and drops the ball into the pedestal. The pedestals are designed with a small piston inside. When the balls are released, the piston is in the down position, leaving a nice hole for the balls to drop into. When the balls are picked up, the piston comes up and pushes the balls into the gripper. Power for each of those pistons is drawn off this line axle in the back that runs the length of the model. And just like the reciprocating arm, each pedestal unit extends it to drive the next one. And when we put all of that together, this is what we get. I have received a few requests for instructions for this, and I might put some together at some point. I would actually like to test it running at a show first to see if it needs any design tweaks, so that might actually take a while. And that's about all I wanted to talk about in this video. As always, thanks for watching, keep on building, and I'll see you in the next one. My name is Jason Elliman, and I designed the Particle Accelerator. This model actually came about completely by accident. My partner Chris and I were brainstorming some ideas for a video where we would build something completely unrealistic using Lego bricks. And a fully functional Particle Accelerator was one of the models we considered. 
That video never actually came about, but I couldn't really get the particle accelerator out of my head. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought that, you know what, maybe I could actually build some version of a working particle accelerator. That was almost seven years ago, and we made a fun little skit video for it that became quite popular. And I received a lot of requests to post it to LEGO Ideas, where it eventually gathered 10,000 supporters, but was ultimately passed over. I was really excited to revisit this model for the Bricklink Designer program to see if I could actually make it work using currently in production parts. And I am really happy with the results. The updated model includes all of the core design elements from the original, the particle insertion module, the collider module, which is now spring-loaded, the accelerator, which uses a spinning wheel to impart energy to the balls, and the control center, which now features a fully decorated interior, including some fun little details, and everything you need to operate a state-of-the-art scientific facility. The accelerator is powered by hand using a crank by default, or you can easily add any LEGO motor to really get things going. It comes with six balls to use as particles, but it can accommodate more if you have them, and it's really fun to see how many you can get going at once. In addition to being entertaining to play with, I think this model can be used as a fun educational tool as well to discuss how real particle accelerators work. I had a lot of fun playing with this model as I was designing it, and I hope a lot of you get the opportunity to enjoy it as well. Hey, what is up everybody, Jason here. Today we're gonna to take a look at my latest Lego creation, which is this small model of two dolphins leaping out of the water. The idea for this model was born probably over a year ago when I got a couple of these dolphins in a Lego Friends set, and I thought it would be cool to build a model of them swimming through the water. So I started tinkering with some options, and the most obvious way of getting the dolphins to follow an arcing path was to mount them at the end of a bar rotating around an axle so the dolphin just spins around in a circle. And this is really quite simple and kind of cool, but in order to get a nice shallow arc, which is what I had in mind for this model, you need to make the circle quite large, and the larger you make that circle, the taller the stand needs to be to house it. And I do really like the movement this results in, but for this model I wasn't interested in building this enormous stand, so I kind of shelved the idea for a bit, and fast forward to earlier this year, I decided to dust it off and work on it some more. This time I started playing around with this dual crank mechanism, which consists of two offset crankshafts supporting these platforms that the dolphins are mounted on. The way it works is that the front of each platform is connected directly to the front crank, and the back of the platform just freely rests on the rear crank. And that way you can vary the offset between the crankshafts to subtly affect the resulting motion. For example, if the crankshafts are completely in sync, the platform will always be horizontal throughout the rotation. But if the front crank leads the rear crank in its rotation, we get this nice shallow arcing motion, which is what I was trying to achieve. And if you experiment with different offsets, you can get some other interesting movement out of it. Or adjust how much of an arc you actually want. As far as the dolphins go, I actually quite like this dolphin mold. But one drawback is that they are quite wide, and would require a four stud wide gap in the water surface. 
And I really wanted to minimize that gap so that it wouldn't be as obvious. So I decided to brick build the dolphins so that they could fit through a two stud wide gap. And of course you can design your own animals or things to put on the platforms. I also designed a couple of killer whales and some shark fins. I also have Emmett holding on for dear life with some creative positioning so that he actually fits through the gap. And I even have Shark Boy here, though I did have to remove his arms for him to fit straight through. As you can see, you can do some fun things with it, and I'm looking forward to tinkering with the mechanism a little bit more to see what else it could be used for. I've created building instructions for this model, which you can find over at jkbrickworks.com. As always, thanks for watching, keep on building, and I'll see you in the next one. A couple of months ago, I posted a video of this printer, which I designed using my Mindstorm ZV3 kit. And in that video, I explained how it all worked. Today, I'm gonna to show you a way of getting it to print text on demand using a system that's been around for almost 200 years, Morse code. Now, there are several ways of getting information to an EV3 brick, but I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, and it doesn't get much simpler than Morse code. All you need to implement it is a single touch sensor. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Morse code, it's essentially just a way of encoding text using a sequence of short and long signals, often referred to as dots and dashes. So, for example, three dots represents the letter S, and three dashes represents the letter O. And here you can see the S and the O have been printed out. I built this handy Lego reference booklet so I didn't have to memorize all the codes. And right now I just have a program to recognize the basic Latin alphabet, but it can certainly be extended. I won't go into too much detail here about the programming. You can find more detailed information about how it all works along with the building instructions and program file over on my website at jkbrickworks.com. One thing I will mention is that in addition to just using a single EV3 to do the encoding and printing, I designed it so that you can use a second EV3 to do the encoding and transmitting and one EV3 just to do the receiving and printing. And I even designed a nice little telegraph key here around this touch sensor to do that, which you saw in the introduction. So I can tap out a code here. This EV3 will encode it, send it to this one over Bluetooth, which will print it out on the printer. As I said, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty details about how all this works, you can check out the blog post and program file on my website. As always, 